Amen. Amen. I welcome everyone tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. And those who are not here should be here. I welcome them in advance as they come next time in Jesus' name. Amen. Encourage them, touch other lives, invite other people. It's not proper, it's not right. And it's not profitable for the church that somebody is leading the house fellowship on Sunday, but he never comes. He doesn't come here to be refreshed, to be renewed, to be empowered, and to be prepared for the work we're given to do. And so all our brethren, all our transport officers, and all the leaders who are over all those people, with our moderators and the refs and everybody, men and women, let's do our best so that our people in the new year can wake up and will come to join together and to learn how to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints, how together be the light that shines into the lives of other people bringing them out of the darkness of ignorance and bringing them to the light of the word and the ministry God has called us to in Jesus' name. I need a better amen. amen. And for those of us who are here to concentrate on the purpose for which we came, to concentrate on wanting to learn, wanting to know more, about the Lord that we can share more about the Lord in the various areas that the Lord has given us privilege to serve. I pray God will lift us up, lift us higher, and make us the kind of workers and leaders we ought to be in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for our workers training. Thank you for your brethren, for our brethren, your own children, your servants, who are always there. And Lord, I pray today you prepare every heart to receive the best from your throne in Jesus' name. Redemption complete for everyone. Full redemption for everyone. Powerful, mighty, uh, mighty redemption for everyone and for the people we're going to touch in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Another amen before you sit down. God bless you. You can sit down. Today, as we come to our workers training, we're looking at Hebrews chapter 9, reading from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Having obtained eternal redemption for us. In verse 15, in verse 15 it tells us, it says, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death they are for the redemption of the transgressions that were passed under the false testament but they which are called might receive the promise of eternal um, eternal inheritance and that's the promise he has given us and that is the redemption he has brought away and we are to spread that news we are to preach the word we are to proclaim the word the word that Christ has already given us and the word that he mentioned on the cross of Calvary it is finished he was our redeemer he is our redeemer and he has done 
done everything he ought to do so we can have full redemption so we can have eternal redemption and so we can have complete redemption through the sacrifice that he offered himself for on the cross of Calvary spreading the word and the wonders of full redemption that's what, what we are talking about today is done it it's done it for us it's done it for the whole world a few people have got the information and they have got the salvation and they have got the redemption and there are many other people who say who oh, Christ has died for and yet they have not received that experience of redemption Redemption, and we need to go out spreading news, spread the word, and let them have the wonders of full redemption. Spreading the word and the wonders of full redemption. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the promise of full redemption by the Lord is promised it. He has even provided it. And now, as he has given us the promise of full redemption complete redemption we need to let other people know number two is the preaching of a fourfold redemption by his laborers we are his laborers and we are his servants and we are to take the word of redemption fourfold one two three four fourfold redemption by his laborers number three where the partakers of the finished redemption with liberation, total liberation, no bondage anymore, total freedom, and there's no captivity anymore because Christ has broken the yoke and He has given us total, final, complete redemption, and He brings that of total liberation. Let's look at number one. Number one is the promise of full redemption by the Lord. The promise of full redemption by the Lord. In Luke chapter 1 verse 72 it says to perform the mercy promise to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. Verse 73 verse 73 the oath which is swear to our father Abraham 74 uh, that he would grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. Verse 75 and it says in holiness and righteousness before him him all the days of our lives. 76, it says, And thou, child John, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. 77, and to give the knowledge of salvation unto his people give the knowledge of salvation unto his people of the redemption he has made for us of the redemption he has purchased for us we need to go out like john john the baptist that will, will give that knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins 78 and, and it says, says through the tender mercy of our God whereby the the, the day spring from on high has visited us. 79. In 79, it says to give light to them that seek in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. We're looking at three things here in the full redemption. Number one, the undeniable promise of thorough redemption. Number two, the unlimited promise of total redemption. Number three, the unwavering promise of time-tested redemption. Look at number one. In number one, we have the undeniable promise, the promise of God that none can deny, the promise of God that will not be denied, the promise of God that not hell or earth 
can reverse. It is given. It is promised already. And Christ has already purchased it on the cross of Calvary. And it will not be denied. And it is a thorough redemption. Thorough redemption in Psalm 130. Reading from verse 7. Let Israel hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy. And with him is plenteous redemption. Plenteous redemption is so deep, is so high, is so wide, is so broad, and none can deny that the Lord Jesus has given us full redemption. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Iniquities within, iniquities external, iniquities surrounding, iniquities underneath, iniquities in the world, iniquities from other nations, iniquities that might come into the life of any child of God, any chosen of God that will pollute their lives, has given us thorough redemption, complete redemption, full redemption that saves us, that uh, sanctifies us. And he gives us that redemption from all iniquities. Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 14. That Jesus Christ gave himself for us. That he might redeem us from all iniquity. The iniquity, any iniquity, no iniquity shall remain. Because Christ has purchased for us sorrow redemption that now we are redeemed from all iniquity and to purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works in second timothy chapter 3 read chapter 2 reading from verse 13 second timothy chapter 2 verse 13 if we believe not yet he abideth faithful yes many there are sinners who have not been saved but Christ abides faithful. There are people who have not taken unto them the redemption that Christ has provided. And yet, Christ abides faithful. He cannot deny himself. The redemption is undeniable. And the Hebrews chapter 6, reading from verse 18, for that by two immutable things, in the which it was impossible for God to lie, we have, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. He set the hope before us. Anyone can come. Everyone can come and we can receive of the redemption that he has provided. How do we come? We come in repentance. How do we come? We come believing. How do we come? We come expecting that what he has promised, he will do. And as we call upon the Lord, turn away from sin, every form of sin, known sin, secret sin, common sin, uncommon sin, peculiar sin, habitual sin, we turn away from them and we call upon the Lord and we say, Lord, here am I. I want that sorrow redemption you are provided we're coming to number two here number two is the unlimited promise of total redemption unlimited promise of total redemption we're looking at jeremiah chapter 15 verse 21 in jeremiah chapter 15 verse 21 and i will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked uh, that's part of the redemption. Uh, there's wickedness, maybe almost everywhere. But wherever you are, wherever you live, and you're the child of God there, and the mark of the blood of the Lamb is upon you, you are delivered already, and you are redeemed from the wicked in Jesus' name. And I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. The people that call themselves terrible, they are not for you. There are people other people call terrible, they are not for you. 
the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, anywhere on earth we find ourselves were redeemed out of the hand of the terrible in Jesus' name. And there are some believers, yes, there are believers, weak believers, ignorant believers. They are running from there, they are running from there, they are running from even here. They are running from, you know, their local church or whatever, because they say, this is terrible. I don't think I can stay here. I don't think I can live here. Those are weak believers. Those people who believe in the Lord anywhere on earth, any street in our city, any location where our churches are, you'll be there. The terrible will not touch you. They might be terrible to others. You might hear news about them for you. It will redeem you out of the hand of the terrible. The people that build their own houses, they spend a lot of money. They stay there for a few nights and they say, I cannot stay here. And we say why some terrible things happen in the night. Weak believer. The Lord has provided, has built that house for you. No terrible man, no terrible woman will drive you out of your, out of your property. Because he will deliver you, redeem you out of the hand of the terrible. If you can't say amen for yourself, say it for me. Amen in your life in Jesus' name. It tells us in Psalm 78. And I'm reading from verse 22 there. Psalm 78, verse 22. Because... They believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. Those people who run here and there, they run elter skelter. The Lord has raised them up and given them a local church over there to live. They are running here and there. They don't believe. The Lord has given them full redemption and they, uh, they have ministry and in the ministry they cannot abide, they are always thinking of terrible, terrible, terrible and they cannot stay they are weak in faith today the Lord strengthen everyone's faith in Jesus name verse 41, in verse 41 yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. He cannot preserve me here. He cannot protect me here. He cannot provide for me here. He cannot make me victor here. He cannot make me triumphant here. They limit the Holy One of Israel. Will not limit God anymore. What he has given us is unlimited redemption. What he has given me. What he has given me is unlimited redemption. Total redemption. It's yours already in Jesus' name. Number three. In number three, we're looking at the wavering promise of time-tested redemption. In Romans chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 24. Romans chapter 3, verse 24, being justified freely. By his grace, already were justified. Already the justifier, Christ, he has paid the whole price, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That redemption is in Christ. And if we're going to have a part of that redemption, if we're going to have our portion in that redemption, we have to come out of the chaos in the world, out of the carnality in the world, out of the corruption in the world, and come in faith to Christ. And it is when we come to him, we find that redemption. We come by faith. 
we come trusting we come leaning upon him depending upon him and we have that redemption in christ jesus look at verse 25 in verse 25 whom god has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood is the is through the blood he cleanses us it's through the blood he purges us it's through the blood he purifies us it's through the blood he makes our lives completely new if any man be in christ is a new creature old things are passed away behold all things have become new. He so purges us, he makes us as white as snow. And we go to him again, he sanctifies us, and he makes us whiter than snow. Because through that blood is to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. In verse 26, it tells us in verse 26 to declare, I say, at this time, the righteousness is righteousness that he might be, but he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. We believe in the Lord. We believe in Jesus. He is the one, the just. That justifies us, the just that acquits us, the just that will not lay any sin on us anymore, the just that makes us now justified and just. And the just shall live by faith. After that justification, after that salvation, after that redemption, we we'll now continue to walk by faith, living. As he expects us to live in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness. Give me a good amen there. The people, even preachers, I'm sorry to say, even preachers, in our church I've not found them here The headquarters But they're somewhere over there They talk about Satan, Satan Every time And talk about demons, demons Every time And in anywhere they are The same congregation They're casting out devils Casting out devils Every time and those people, they're supposed to be saved. They're supposed to be born again. They're casting out devils out of them. They even try to cast out, uh, devils out of their family. You know, the, the families, are, 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 they profess to be saved. They profess to be born again. And yet, they still cast out devils. Casting out devils out of their wife, casting out devils out of their children, and I don't know some why secretly ca ca casting out devils from their believing husbands. They believe that even those who are saved and those who are redeemed and those who are children of God, they believe they still are possessed of demons. I hope no preacher here continues like that. If they continue like that, they don't have faith in what we believe. We're not emphasizing the same thing. We're not contending for the same faith. If uh, you know, they continue like that, we might have to take them out of our pulpit. Here it says, Christ has delivered us from the power of darkness. And he has translated us into the kingdom of of his dear son that's what he has done already and we need to have faith in the accomplished redemption of christ we need to have faith in the accomplished salvation accomplished deliverance accomplished dominion accomplished work of christ at calvary look at that again who has delivered us 
not just going to do it. He's done it already. He's delivered us from the power of darkness. And he has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, in whom we have redemption. We have that already. If we're born again, we're not praying for the redemption, for the salvation, for restoration every day, every meeting, every Sunday, confessing sin, every Sunday, confessing sin, every week. You have the power to overcome. You have the grace to overcome and you have the ability to overcome. Why do you then, I would say, deliberately go into the forbidding sin and then you have to be crying and praying and fasting. Oh Lord, I've done it again. Don't do it again. You have the grace. If Christ lives in you, you, have, you don't have to do that again. It says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The Lord confirm it in every life in Jesus' name. We come to point number two. Point number two, the preaching of a fourfold redemption by his laborers. We are the laborers of the Lord and we're building together with him. And because we're building together with him, we say what he says. We preach what he would have preached. And we see Calvary. We see what he has done for us at Calvary. And we profess that. We proclaim that. We declare that, we preach that the word of Christ at Calvary, the victory, the triumph of Christ at Calvary. In First Corinthians chapter 1, reading from chapter 3, reading from verse 9. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. We are laborers together with God. He does the work and he chooses us as partners, as laborers together with him. There's a lot there. Now, it's always at the work. My father walketh either to and I work. If you quit, you leave God at the work who is partner in progress, who is partner in labor, you leave him there and you run away. That will not be right. If you are not faithful, God is faithful, and your unfaithfulness spoils his work because we're laborers together with him. You have, by his grace, by his strength, you have to remain faithful because you are working together with him. If you bring in strangers, strangers to the grace of God, strangers to the doctrines of the Bible, strangers to the truths of the word of God, while you are partners together with God, it's not acceptable to God. He said, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So you cannot bring believers to join you in the work. You are not just appoint anybody. I'm appointed. I'm put in place. I'm chosen. I'm placed here. And I have a worldly friend, a sinner friend, a somebody outside the kingdom. And he has secular knowledge, material knowledge. He has the same expertise that I have. And then you bring him in. No, you can't do that. Your partners together, laborers together with God. And you cannot go and bring somebody. In fact, you cannot bring your family member who doesn't show the sign of being born again. You cannot bring your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter, your parent, anyone related to you who is not born again, who is not called of God to come. Well, I have this chance here. I have this calling here. Come, let's do this together. Uh, you know, I do that because I want to keep them uh, in the faith. I want to keep them in the church. You can't do 
feel that we are laborers together with God. And then he says, Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. In verse 10, in verse 10 he says, According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take it how he buildeth thereupon. Verse 11. In verse 11, he says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. In Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, we then as workers together with him. Do you go out to do the work without allowing God to go along with you? Without praying before you do the work? Without relying on him? Without reading his word? Without knowing what's the mind of the Lord? What's the heart of the Lord? And then you run off with the work without depending on the grace and the goodness and the power and the guidance of the Lord. We, we then as workers together with him beseech you also uh, uh, also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Look at verse 2. In verse 2 for he, for he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted and in the day of salvation have I succored thee Behold now is the accepted time. Behold now is the day of salvation. Any time we come across somebody who is not saved, we're partners together with God, workers together with God, laborers together with God. God will want that individual to be saved. He wants all to be saved. And since we are partnering with him, we are laboring together with him, we are working together with him, he would have spoken, but he has given us the chance to speak. And we we'll speak to them the word of salvation. We don't carry on friendship with a backslider without telling them, you must be restored unto the Lord. Why? We are workers together with God. Laborers together with God. The very first thing, the essential thing, the indispensable thing, the urgent thing God will want to pass across to the sinner and to the backslider. They must be saved. They must be restored. And if we're working together with him, that will be the urgent thing. That will be the primary thing. That will be the essential thing. We tell them they must be reconciled unto the Lord, restored unto the Lord. Three things we're looking at. Number one, we're looking at preaching redemption from the pollution of sins. Number two, preaching redemption from the pleasure of sin. Number three, preaching redemption from the power of of sin. Number four, preaching redemption from the plague of sickness. Look at number one. Number one is preaching and proclaiming and declaring redemption from the pollution of sins. That's what he has delivered us from. That's what he has redeemed us from. I say chapter 1, reading from verse 15. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear you. Your hands are full of blood. That's the pollution. Verse 16. In verse 16, wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes cease to do evil. It's a command. If we want to be in good relationship with him, 
if we want to enjoy the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, if we have experienced that redemption was seized from evil, all those pollutions are cleansed away. In verse 17, verse 17, it says, learn to do well. Uh, that just me I don't know how to do better Learn to do well That's my nature That's my character If you want to accept me Accept me That's all I can do uh -uh. Learn We have to learn We're children of God We should not remain When we were You know some people say Actually pastor um, I'm born again I'm a Christian But I'm trained to do what I'm doing in a place, you know, training, um, you know, place where we go. They train us as, uh, you know, professional this way, professional that way. This is how to work. But you understand, there are unchristian principles, unchristian patterns. In those trainings, as you come to the Lord, you will wash up. As you come to the Lord, you'll take off all those corrupted patterns of training. Any training you have that makes you insincere, any training you have that makes you sinful, any training you have that makes you hypocrite, any training you have that makes you deceptive, any training you have that makes you spoil the work of God, you know you ought to be saved from that. And there are people who are trained like that. They are trained in that profession, they are trained in that profession, and they are trained to do what is not acceptable in the work of the Lord and in the service of the Lord. Part of salvation is to become a new creature. Part of salvation is to be cleansed and to be purged from any pollution from the training of the world, the corruption that is in the world. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. He saves us. He purges us. He kind of purifies us from all the pollutions of sin, all the pollutions of society, all the pollutions from our training. He purges us from that. And then it says he makes us as white as snow. And it says don't be red like crimson. They shall be as wool. It tells us in um, First Peter chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 18, First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 8, for as much as she know that she were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation your vain character, your vain manner of life, your vain lifestyle. You were not redeemed by silver and gold, but by the precious look at from the received by tradition from your fathers. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot that the redemption he has given us number one he gives us redemption from the pollution of seas we're looking at number two number two preaching redemption from the pleasure of sin there is pleasure in sin sinful pleasure and there are, you know, things that people derive from sinning. If they didn't derive any pleasure, they will not be doing it. There is pleasure, sinful pleasure in pornography. If there is no pleasure in pornography, nobody will go that direction. There is pleasure in immorality. There is pleasure in fornication and adultery. 
if there was no pleasure there, nobody will practice it. It's because if it gives them pain, if it gives them a mental problem, if it gives them something contrary to what they desire, they will not be doing it. And backsliders, if you backslide and you go into sin, it's because of the pleasure of sin, the pleasure of sinfulness. And when we're truly saved, He saves us, He redeems us, number one, from the pollution of sin. Number two, He redeems us, He saves us, He takes our interest away from the pleasure of sin. He tells us in Romans, chapter 1, reading from verse 28. Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do the things which are not convenient. Verse 29. In verse 29, being filled with all righteousness. Look at this fornication. There are people who still, who still derive a pleasure in fornication already, you know. They are not born again. They are not saved. They were saved. They've lost salvation long, long ago. They must still talk about salvation. They must still even witness salvation, salvation. They must still tell other people, born again, born again, except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God, but... If he remains and continues in the pleasure of fornication, he cannot retain salvation in that condition. And then it goes on to say wickedness. There are people that have pleasure in wickedness. They laugh about it. They rejoice about it. They know they are being wicked, but they are happy for that. Pleasure of wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers. And then in Bastachi, it says backbiters and haters of God and despiteful, proud, uh, um, it says, uh, boasters, inventors of evil things, inventors of evil things. There are people who invent, uh, you know, things that were not there before, but they invent that, evil things. They invent evil. They invent the things that were not there before, and all those fleshly things that were not there before, they just make them come up, come up, because they have leaning towards di that direction. Of course, you know, it's not the grace of God creating that in them. It's not the goodness of God creating that in them. It's their inward evil depravity, inward evil propensity. And they're disobedient to parents. Now he talks about disobedience to parents. Uh, your parents, uh, you know, uh, your biological parents, if they tell you to do something good, something normal, something appropriate, something scriptural, and you disobey them, it's sinful, it's sinful. Come to the church where the pastors, they are parents. And you know, that's why you call me your father father in the Lord. If you call me your father in the Lord, but you are disobeying me, there's carnality inside you. You call a person a father in the Lord. He teaches you the word. He brings the word of life. He brings the bread of life unto you. Instead of appreciating and honoring and obeying, you're biting the finger that feeds you with the word of God. And you're trying to lay something on him. You're disobeying obedient to parents. It is one of the characteristics of the people that have pleasure in sinfulness. In verse 31, in verse 31, without understanding. And then he calls them covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. We're going to verse 32. In verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God that they will commit such things are worthy of death, worthy of death, worthy of eternal death, worthy of the second death, worthy of the punishment everlasting death. Not only do the same, but they have pleasure, they have pleasure, 
they have pleasure in them that do them when we're saved we're saved from the pollutions of sin we're saved from the pleasure of sin look at number three here number three we, we preach redemption from the power of sin that christ lives in us and he breaks the power of cancel sin that sin does not have dominion over us anymore if there's anybody that is saying i don't want to do that but I, I, I can't overcome it It always just comes to me Then you don't have power over that sin You don't have victory over that sin You are not triumphant over that sin You know, I've even prayed, I've confessed And I've turned away from it But I don't know why I find myself doing it all the time then you're under the power of that sin the sin is on top and you're underneath but redemption redemption has given us power over sin power above sin we're looking at romans chapter 6 and we're reading from verse 6 romans chapter 6 we're reading from verse 6 knowing this that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed not managed not tolerated not hidden not petted we're not petting the body of sin we're not tolerating the body of sin christ comes into our lives as savior as lord as conqueror and he conquers the power of sin and he tells us that that body of sin that root of sin that nucleus of sin that producer of sin that generator generating source of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin but seven in verse 7 it says for sin for he that is dead is freed from sin he that is dead is free from sin emotional sin anger attitudinal sin pride fleshly sin sensual things carnal sins he gives us victory over that because it says for he that is dead is freed from sin look at verse 11 in verse 11 likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin so that the uh, sin will not have power or dominion over you but alive unto god through jesus christ our lord verse 12 in verse 12 it says let not sin therefore reign over in your mortal body if you are saved you have the power you have the know-how you have the ability you have the grace to stop that sinfulness and say you will not continue in my life if you are not making any effort either you are an ignorant believer or you are a negligent believer or you are a blind believer you are not looking at the future and you're not looking at where you will spend eternity or you're just a lazy believer you are so lazy that even though the sin is attempting to crawl over you you cannot even wave your hand and beat it off but if you are a christian a believer alert to the calling of god in your life let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof we're looking at first john chapter 3 reading from verse 5 first john chapter 3 we're reading from verse 5 and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins he takes away 
the pollution of sin. It takes away the power of sin. It takes away the domineering nature of sin over us. He cleanses, he purges, he washes, and he destroys the power of sin from our lives. You know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin. Verse 6. In verse 6, whatsoever abideth in him sinneth not. Why? Because he has been redeemed from the pollution of sin. Because he has been redeemed from the pleasure of sin. Why? Because he has been redeemed from the power of sin. Because of that, he does not continue in sinning. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. If we know him as Savior, we overcome sin. If we know him as the deliverer, redeemer from sin, we overcome sin. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, little children, young converts, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Verse 8, he that committeth sin, tell me, tell me out aloud, tell me confidently, he that committeth sin. And you tell yourself, if you are still committing sin, this new year, the same old life, the same old weakness, the same old iniquity still there. The same old habitual practice of sinfulness is still there. Nothing new. And the people around you are not surprised. They know that well. That the way he normally lives. That's the way she normally lives. You should understand. It's not God that is bringing that up in your life, it is the devil. It's like you make yourself a servant of Satan, of sin, of self, deliberately. And you might have your excuse, you might have your reason, but he that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Amen. Amen. Look at verse 9. Verse 9. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Can I submit to you that that should be the number one leading standard in your life. Forget about position. Forget about your popularity. Forget about who you are and what you do in the church. The number one leading thing in every life, every life of a born again child of God is this. Whoever, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Preaching will not take you to heaven. Being a prayer warrior will not take you to heaven. Singing will not take you to heaven. Professional work that you do, electronics, electrical, will not take you to heaven. Anything you do in the church will not take you to heaven if you are not victorious over sin. This is the bottom line. And this is the number one thing we shall reckon with in our lives. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him 
and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Give me a good, good amen. amen. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, in this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness, is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. We're coming to point number three. Point number three. Uh, sorry, number four here. Point number two, number four. Preaching redemption from the plague of sinfulness and the plague of sickness. We're looking at uh, Psalm 103. We're reading from verse 3. Psalm 103, verse 3. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities and the same way who healeth all thy diseases who forgiveth all thine iniquities who healeth all thy diseases but i need to remind you forgiveness takes us from earth to heaven our sins are forgiven we're saved we're born again we're redeemed from all iniquity our name is written in the book of life in heaven saved Save, save throughout eternity when we get there. But healing is for this earth. We need to remember that so that we don't exalt healing above the forgiveness. So that we don't exalt deliverance from sickness above the salvation of our soul. Many people have that tendency. Healing, healing, healing. And I about holiness, yes, I know it's in the Bible. I love it too, but I want healing now, now, now. Now, holiness is more important than healing. Forgiveness more important than healing. Follow peace with all men. Follow peace with me too. I'm part of all the all men. If you're fighting against sound doctrine, you're not following peace with me. If I'm contending for the faith, once delivered unto the saints, and you are contradicting that faith, and you're trying to stop me, you're not at peace with me. If I am leading the church and leading the people to peace and holiness, without which no man shall say the Lord, and you are in a secret conspiracy, will bring him down, will shut his mouth. He cannot see that again will frighten him so you will not be for holiness 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 and even the illustrations is given is coming my direction i have to find a way and have people around me to stop him if you are doing that whether you do that openly or you do that secretly or you do that and you know with planning and with the support of other people you are not honestly contending with with me in this same faith you are not following peace with me you are fighting with me because I spoke about your sin because I warned you that if you continue like that you will not get to heaven you have to follow peace with me if you're going to heaven because I'm standing for God I'm doing the work of God I'm preaching the word that will get people saved and get them then to go to heaven, contradicting that, you're fighting a losing battle because the preacher of holiness will win. Those who have the intention, the heart, the sincerity, the passion to take people to heaven will, will win in Jesus' name. And you know what? We will be the judge of sinners and backsliders when we get over there. Well, the judge, don't you know that we shall even judge angels? They are fighting against somebody who is going to judge you on the final day. We need to be at peace together and understand that 
holiness is more important than healing. Healing is there, deliverance is there, and Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. And when we pray, healing will come in Jesus' name. In James chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 14. James chapter 5, verse 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15, in verse 15, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. The Lord say good amen. amen. And the Lord shall raise you up. And if he has committed any sins, they shall be forgiven him. In verse 16, verse 16 tells us, confess your faults one to another. Don't hide your faults. Don't cover up your faults. Don't use signs and symbols to cover up your faults. Don't use, uh, you know, whatever will drive that man away, whatever will drive that person away. He will not look my direction again, less frightening him. Don't use that. It's so scriptural. Confess your faults, your sin, one to another, and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual prayer of a righteous man, tell me, it will avail on your behalf in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three, partakers of finished redemption with liberation. Partakers of finished redemption by with liberation. It tells us in John chapter 19, I'm reading the last line in verse 30. In verse 30, the middle line, it says, It is finished, finalized. Your salvation secured. Your healing secured. Your deliverance secured. It is finished. Finished redemption with liberation. Three things we're looking at. Number one, number one the triumphant possessors, triumphant possessors of faultless redemption. Number two, the timeless proclaimers of fruit-bearing redemption. Number three, the timely uh, propagation of the finished redemption. Look at number one. Number one is the triumphant possessors of the faultless redemption. He gives us to possess and he makes us triumphant. In First John chapter 5 verses 4 and 5. First John chapter 5 verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, it tells us, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Sin taken away, sickness taken away, and all the consequences of sin taken away. And then it tells us, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself and that wicked one touches him not, touches me not, touches me not. When that evil person, evil power, evil spirit wants to touch you with sickness or whatever, and then you stay there crying, he wants to take my life, he wants to kill me, you're not standing on your authority. From today, stand on your authority. Yeah. He will not touch you. Yeah. He will not kill you prematurely. 
because he that is born of God sinneth not. And this we know that that wicked one touches him not. Amen. Amen. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 3. Because we're redeemed and because his power is in our lives according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue. Verse 4, in verse 4 it says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through laws. You escape them all in Jesus' name. We're looking at number two here. Number two, the timeless proclaimers of fruit bearing redemption timeless we're doing it and doing it and time does not tell on us that makes us weak and weary worn out that we say we cannot do it again we keep on doing it until it calls for us to come home in jesus name acts chapter 20 i'm reading from verse 26 acts chapter 20 we're looking at verse 26, whereby, wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Verse 27, for I have not shunned to declare unto you. I have not neglected to declare unto you. I have not shut my duty in declaring unto you all the counsel of God. All the counsel of God. Think about Paul the Apostle. From a repentance to the final resurrection and rapture. And everything in between. He declared unto the people. And think about us. What we need to do. As we earnestly contend for the faith. Which was once delivered unto the saints. That all the counsel of God. From, uh, from righteousness. From repentance. Redemption. Redemption, remission of sin and uh, you know spiritual resurrection until the final resurrection of the rapture and hell and heaven and every teaching of the word of God we ought to say like Paul the apostle for I have not shown to declare unto you all the counsel the whole counsel of God verse 28 in verse 28 take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, has made you pastors, has made you preachers, has made you evangelists, has made you Christian worker, has made you laborers together with God to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. We keep on proclaiming the fruit bearing redemption until he comes. Look at number three. Number three is uh, the timely propagation of the finished redemption. It's finished it. And now we have to proclaim and to propagate and to spread it abroad everywhere and to teach and to preach to everyone that we meet in Mark chapter 16 reading from verse 15 and he said unto them and he says unto us go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature verse 16 he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be damned. And then in verse 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Verse 18, And they shall, lay, they shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. 
Give me a good amen. amen. Christ will preserve your life. And anyone that will contradict Christ and prove Christ a liar and then give you something to eat or something to drink that will, okay, he said that Jesus said, but I want to prove that Jesus is wrong. And then he gives you something to eat or drink that will terminate your life. He's fighting against Christ and Christ will fight against you. He wants to conquer Christ, but Christ will conquer him. And because he's a contradictor of Christ, Christ is in heaven, he will not be in the same place with Christ forever. I lost my amen. Christ in heaven, anyone trying to contradict or walk against Christ will not be in heaven, will be in hell. Well, hell is in the Bible. It's revelation of God. And so, anything that comes from the Bible, when we proclaim it, the church has to say, Amen. Amen. Now, it says, they shall take off serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay their hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Verse 19, it says in verse 19, So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Verse 20, in verse 20, And they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord walking with them. Were laborers together with God. The Lord walking with them. Were builders together with God. And the Lord walking with them. And because when partnership with God, laboring with God, and working with God, and building with God, the Lord walking with them and confirming the word was signs following. As we go out and we we'll proclaim the word and teach the word and emphasize the word and bring the word of salvation to the people that are perishing through you, through me, through us together here at the headquarters, here and uh, all over in the city and everywhere in our nation, everywhere in the various nations, many will come to know the Lord in Jesus' name. And when the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we that have life will be caught up together with them, when the saints go marching in, you will be there. I will be there. Our brothers and sisters will be there. Our converts and the people, disciples, were, uh, were discipling. They will be there in Jesus' name. Our evangelism will not be in vain. Our soul winning will not be in vain. Our discipling, follow up, will not be in vain. Our following after the Lord will not be in vain in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, we came to hear your word and we have heard your word. We're taking that word back to the Lord, that the Lord himself will strengthen us. The Lord himself will equip us more so that we will preach this word, proclaim this word, declare this word and go everywhere announcing that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. We ask our moderator in Lagos to come and lead us in prayer. Moderator from Lagos, please come and lead us in prayer. 